Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50%, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, Visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster... For your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My name is Jessie. I'm a United States Special Forces widow. This gives me a unique perspective on the world around us. If you're willing to listen... I'll tell you how I see it, and I won't pull any punches. This is my POV, which stands for Point of View. All right, this is Jesse. How y'all doing tonight? You know, I really miss you when I'm not with you. Now, I got to apologize for the replay last night. Well, I shouldn't have to apologize, but I'm going to. I had a friend who needed me. And as I've said, while I love you guys to death, 
my friends will always come first. Now, if you get to know me better, hang out with me in the chat room, talk with me on Twitter, you might become one of my friends. All right. <clears throat> so I had a friend in an emergency and I took the night off. But most of you hadn't heard that show because very few of you actually listened to it. I know, I was competing with the debate. All right, so what is going on in the world? Yeah, I got my show prep. I got it right here. Oh, yeah. And I've got last night's, too. Because I didn't find out about my friend's crisis until just a little bit before I was supposed to be on the air. And I made the decision to pull the show. Alright. As we have for the past couple of episodes, we are going to start off with what's happening in Mosul. Got to get you your Mosul updates. Now I've got several fairly lengthy audio clips on this. We're going to take them one at a time. And this includes General Townsend. He is on the ground in Iraq. He is the commander on the ground doing the coordinating everything. So I like, I definitely like to get, for lack of a term, the words from the horse's mouth. So, why don't we get started with his clip, and we'll go from there, because his is the most important, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's evening here in uh, Baghdad. I appreciate this opportunity to offer a few thoughts on our campaign to defeat ISIL in Iraq and Syria. I'll start with an update on the progress of the Iraqi security forces and the support coalition troops are providing them in the ongoing fight for Mosul. Then I'll give you a short update on our developing plans to liberate Raqqa in Syria. First, progress towards Mosul. The Iraqi security forces had developed a lot of momentum over the past two years. And now we're seeing that momentum continue against ISIL, our common enemy, in Mosul. The ISF are steadily advancing on multiple axes towards the city. The Mosul Offensive is a large and extraordinarily complex operation that the Iraqis have been planning for a very long time. They're the ones making the decisions, and their forces are the ones who will enter Mosul and raise the Iraqi flag in the center of the city. We assisted them with the planning and preparation of forces and have provided advice and assistance such as air and artillery strikes and intelligence to support the Iraqi operations. The coalition has delivered more than 2,100 aerial bombs, artillery and mortar shells, HIMARS rockets and Hellfire missiles since the Iraqis started operations to liberate Mosul on October 17th. This relentless campaign of strikes has removed hundreds of fighters, weapons, and key leaders from the battlefield in front of the Iraqi advance. Our coalition leaders and advisors on the ground coordinate daily with the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces to adjust our support because we understand their forces are fighting every day for their very lives and their freedom from ISIL, also known as Daesh. All of this, all of this support is in addition to the substantial investment in weapons, equipment, and training the coalition is provided to the ISF to ensure they have what it takes to be successful. A few days before Mosul operations began, I attended the Iraqis' final operational briefing, where each commander responsible for a different axis of advance provided their plan to the Prime Minister. I can tell you that it was clear to me that night that the sovereign nation of Iraq owns this fight. There's a lot of hard fighting ahead, but we're confident the Iraqis will be successful. On behalf of the coalition, I want to recognize the heroic sacrifices of the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces and their martyrs and their families. 
It's good to see them pressing steadily forward on the battlefield, and we will continue supporting them until Mosul and all of Iraq is free from ISIL. Now a bit on Syria. Our Syrian partners in Turkey have continued advancing and have pushed ISIL farther from Turkey's border. This is a complicated battle space amid regional security concerns and adjacent to a civil war. And that makes for a complicated planning effort. We're working with our allies, our partners, coalition members to refine the military plan for the isolation and eventual liberation of Raqqa. While that planning effort is ongoing, we will continue conducting precision strikes to reduce the enemy's freedom of movement, attack their leaders and command and control, and their ability to Battle space is crowded and complicated. We're finding that Daesh, with their brutal treatment of anyone who doesn't share their twisted ideology, is generating a willingness among local populations to fight them and drive them from their safe havens. This gives us confidence that ISIL will also be driven from Raqqa. Our coalition is committed to their defeat because we understand that de defeating them in Iraq and Syria is an essential step in, their de in the defeat of ISIL around the world. In closing, I want to remind the people of the United States and of all the nations of the coalition that their troops in this region are serving selflessly and with great courage in harm's way to ensure the defeat of ISIL. You should be proud of their efforts as you hope and pray for their success and safety. I am now, I know that I am proud to stand in their ranks. All right, so there, you got the update from the horse's mouth. Now, of course, there was a lot more said. It was an hour-long press conference. I'm not bringing you the full hour. But it does say that they are involving the locals, and that's their goal. That's what they want. And for everybody I've talked to, including my own recurring guest, Justin Kinney, that's what they need to do to succeed. They need to do more with locals. And there's just no two ways about it. All right, so I've got a little bit more of a tactical kind of update. I don't know how else you want to put it, but... And let's, we'll get to Turkey in just a minute, because they're part of this whole chaos too. And is it any surprise to any of you? It has been confirmed. Daesh is using human shields. Hello? I told you that how long ago? That they were going to do it and I even played a clip backing that up I'm trying to see if I can key it up at just the right spot people and video it they burn people a lot all right hang on trying to get to the right spot gunfire around working on it for you because I want you to hear this and we'll just play the whole thing gunfire erupted on the streets of the Iraqi city of Kirkuk after ISIS militants launched a surprise attack video captured the terrorists entering at night ongoing clashes reported ISIS's sudden attack into Kirkuk some 100 miles southeast of Mosul is seen by U.S. military officials as an ISIS attempt to divert Iraqi forces from the larger fight to retake Mosul. Kirkuk, still a city of strategic significance because of its large oil reserves. They are a very uh, resilient and challenging foe. They're very adaptable, uh, very creative, cunning. 
The first U.S. service member to be killed in the Mosul operation died after his vehicle hit an IED. Up to 200 U.S. troops are in and around Mosul advising Iraqi and Kurdish forces. They are confronting initial rings of bombs and booby traps outside the city. ISIS seen new video of clashes. Its weapons defenses are even greater inside Mosul. U.S. officials say the top U.S. commander telling the BBC ISIS must be stopped. They saw people's heads off on TV. They drown people and video it. They burn people alive in cages. They crucify people. And they drive over people on the street with bulldozers. Are they using human shields in there? Yeah, they're probably using human shields in there. The U.S. believes some... All right, that was the part I wanted you to hear. That they are most likely using human shields. I mean, come on. Like he said, they drown people and videotape it. They do all kinds of crazy things. And you think they're going to be kind and not use a human shield? Yeah, I don't think so. So... I but let's just say they're using human shields and get over it. No surprise. They ha they commit atrocities. Now, fighters are grabbing civilians. Do you know why? They hope to avoid airstrikes. Oh yes. That's their goal. They want to avoid the almighty airstrike. We all know that place, the pizza joint okay. that used to be Sorry a massage that. clinic that used to be a florist. Seems I had something auto load in the background. Apologize for that. You know I'm always up to something. Aren't I? Yeah. I'm always up to something. Any of you, all right, so the Kurdish and Iraqi forces are taking the lead. And I do say Kurdish and Iraqi forces. Now, I think my Kurds are pretty awesome, but I'm also glad to see the Iraqi military at least walking or toddling with U.S. help. Because quite frankly, they didn't have it before. They weren't there. They were struggling to get the job done and they were fleeing. Not what we want. <coughs> Pardon me, folks. Mr. Frog is very prevalent this week. I have a feeling your show host is coming down with a touch of the creep, touch of the ickies. All right. Now back to Mosul. I've got a really awesome story out of Mosul. Yeah, I know. Awesome and Mosul in the same sentence. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk it? But I found one. I found a good news story out of Mosul. The sniper of Mosul is picking off jihadis one by one. A renegade sniper has been striking fear into the hearts of terrorists in Mosul, picking off local jihadis one by one, including an ISIS executioner moments before he was to behead a teenage boy. The mysterious marksman dubbed the sniper of Mosul is believed to be behind shootings in four separate neighborhoods of the Iraqi city. The officials think he could be receiving help from other sharpshooters. He's been hunting down militants in broad daylight, with the most recent hit unfolding during a public beheading. 
Iraqi media outlets Muddy reported that the enigmatic sniper had killed an Islamic State executioner just seconds before he could take the life of a local teen who was accused. Yes, I said teen. Local teenager. Just seconds before he could take the life of the local teen who was accused of supporting resistance movements within Mosul. His bullet struck the ISIS savage just as he was taking him at the boy's neck. The attack prompted the terrorists to frantically open fire and scatter as they attempted to find cover. Shootings have left a number of jihadis dead, according to Al Samaria News. Despite the sniper's efforts, unfortunately, the ISIS fighters were able to shoot and kill the boy before he was able to escape. The gunman or gunmen, and I'm going to add or gunwomen, there are some Kurdish women out there who I've heard are quite the crack shot. Have been targeting extremists in Mosul for several days as Iraqi-led coalition forces continue to, their battle to retake the Islamic State stronghold. The emergence of the sniper of Mosul, as the residents call him, increased the pace of popular resistance against ISIS. The presence of the sniper in four neighborhoods emphasizes there are many snipers, not only one. Some believe the sniper of Mosul could be part of an elite special forces team, though it is unclear whether they are Iraqi or allied soldiers. While the man is certainly na making a name for himself, he isn't the first to make the headlines for taking out member of ISIS. In January, another mysterious marksman dubbed Daesh Hunter had extremists on the run in Libya after he assassinated a few of the group's terror chiefs. At least three Islamic straight State Daesh leaders were killed by the lone sniper over a span of 10 days, sparking a quote-unquote state of terror in the ranks of the terrorists. Gotta love a story like that. Got to love a story like that. Okay, I'm thumbing through stuff because I haven't had, I have been short on show prep time all around. And my schedule, I'm afraid to tell you guys, is only going to get busier and I got to cut tonight's show just a few minutes short. Yeah, I do. Because you're going to get another chance to hear me tonight. I'm sitting in for Rick on the Jen and Rick show which follows mine, and I need a few minutes to spool everything up. All right, can Iraq, this is, can Mosul survive Daesh? Can Mosul overcome the horrible reign of Daesh and rise again as an Iraqi center of education and culture? Now, just for reference, this one's from Al Jazeera. I like to warn you when they're, they're from really odd places. Traditionally, Mosul has been viewed as one of the three pillars of Iraq alongside cities of Baghdad and Basra, dating back to a, Iraq's administrative layout under the Ottoman Empire. The three cities were capitals of three Ottoman provinces bearing the same name. While the three provinces enjoyed local governance, the city of Baghdad retained administrative powers over all three provinces for the majority of the empire's existence. Owing to Mosul's historic ties to Baghdad and Basra, the League of Nations declared at the time, yes, I just said League of Nations, declared at the time, decided at the time, that the Mosul province would be administered by Iraq rather than Turkey during the establishment of the modern-day Iraqi state. Now, pause here. Many of the Middle Eastern borders were drawn by Western countries. Okay, let's just get that out there. The newly defined Iraqi state reflected Ottoman Iraq both geographically and administratively. This enabled the seamless transition of Baghdad as the Iraqi capital and retained Mosul and Basra as the country's other influential economic hubs. While Mosul is home to a vast number of ethnicities and sects, 
its wealth of unique surrounding villages, all bustling with Iraqs, Kurds, Yazidis, Shabak, Christian, Assyrians, Armenians, led to Mosul's unique cultural mix and diversity. Despite Mosul's location up north, what connected Mawasis, residents of Mosul, to the rest of Iraq was their significant class of educated citizens and highly regarded institutions. In general, Mawasawis were well educated and respected by the rest of Iraq. Many Iraqis would go to the city to attend the prestigious University of Mosul, whose medical college back, dates back to the earliest establishment of the Iraqi state. If educated Iraqis were not going to Mosul to study, the educated people of Mosul were coming to the rest of Iraq to teach, it was, as was evident in schools and universities across the country. Mosul also represents the city that provides Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime with a large number of military and security personnel. Unlike Baghdad and Basra, Mosul did not fight the U.S.-led war in 2003. Instead, the regime loyalists and the military simply in integrated with the civilian population. This has meant that a large concentration of ex-regime loyalists were based in Mosul, which was evident when Saddam Hussein's sons were caught hiding in Mosul in 2003. Hence, when Mosul fell to Daesh in 2014, many in Iraq were not surprised. The steady collapse of Daesh around Iraq leaves little doubt about the ability of the Iraqi security forces to liberate Mosul. The question is not if, but how long will it take? The question for the ordinary Iraqi remains how long will they view Mosul and its re how, how will they view Mosul and its residents after the city is liberated? Before the day shock occupation, the city was fairly isolated. It did not enjoy a constant flow of visitors from different parts of the country. The day shock occupation further isolated Mosul and its people from the rest of Iraq. The government has re largely relied on, largely and wisely relied on, Iraqi special forces to conduct the operation, leaving out the contra controversial popular mobilization units. The, the message being this is not a sectarian attack on Mosul. By mo popular mo mobilization units, they're talking about Muslims of another religion who would love nothing more than to go attack Mosul. The question going forward is, will Mosul remain a pillar of Iraqi identity or will the legacy of Daesh's occupation result in a trust loss between Malasawis and the rest of Iraqis? Well, hello, Host Kitty. Pardon you, Host Kitty. I love you. I don't need you walking on the keyboard. Po per question was posed to a former Iraqi general and resident of the city with relatives still living there. Mosul can remain these Mosul of old, the Mosul of officers, teachers, and professors, only if Malsawis want that to happen. Evidence of this is witnessed by the recent liberated Christian Assyrian villages of Bartella, Karakush, and Karakush, just outside of Mosul. For the Iraqi Special Forces, there is a newly built trust between the locals and Iraqi Special Forces that will be vital for the future of Iraq if this trust is replicated in the liberation of Mosul. Ultimately, it will be up to the people of Mosul to decide what the new Mosul will be known for. If they're able to overcome <laughs> the horrible psychological and social trauma of ISIL's regime, the Mosul again can once again rise as a center of education, culture, and professionals. I'd like to see that happen. I really would. I'd like to see Mosul once again become a thriving cultural center. All right. My, oh my, where does the time fly? We are at the bottom of the hour. And that means I got to pay them bills and take that commercial break. 
So I will see you on the other side. The following message contains a special offer for listeners of this station. Are you a man over 40? Are you constantly looking for the nearest bathroom? Do you wake up multiple times a night to use the bathroom? Right now, Perfect Prostate is sending out free bottles of their groundbreaking new formula to listeners of this station. Perfect Prostate formula was developed by medical doctor Mitchell Fleischer, and its ingredients have been clinically studied to reduce your frequent nighttime bathroom visits and promote healthy urine flow. Right now, preferred customers get their first bottle of Perfect Prostate absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. Perfect Prostate is guaranteed to reduce that constant urge to use the bathroom, especially at night, and promote healthy urine flow. Don't wait. Call now for your free bottle. Just pay shipping and processing. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Supplies are limited. One free bottle per household. Call now. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. Poems becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. A Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, Visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. You can lay it down if you want to. You can run away if you want to. You can pretend that this is totally okay if you want to. You can play it dead if you want to. Forget what they say.
All right, thank you all for hanging in there with me during that commercial break. As you know, I like to change topics after we got through Mosul. And we have actually done a lot on Mosul. Although, I will admit, I didn't do as much as I do some other days. All right, I'll admit it. First one to admit it, some days I do more, some days I do less. But what can I say? Every day and every show is a little different. That's why I have to listen to all of them. All right. You don't think that Iran has left Iraq alone. Nope. Well, right now in the battle to defeat ISIS, action near the front lines as Iraqi special forces move thousands of civilians from villages near Mosul as they work to recapture the Islamic State stronghold. This comes as Defense Secretary Ash Carter says coalition forces may soon expand a campaign to retake Mosul to include the ISIS capital of Raqqa inside Syria. Benjamin Hall is live in Rabiul, Iraq with more. Benjamin? Hi, Jenna. Well, today there was a real lull in the fighting as Iraqi troops sought to consolidate some of the gains that they've made over the last few days. You can see it, if you will, as the calm before the main assault on Mosul. Today, troops did begin massing uh, nearer Mosul, bringing in reinforcements for that battle. But ahead of them, ISIS is said to also be preparing, with some media reporting that hundreds of fighters have been seen entering the city from the west wearing suicide vests. Now, that couldn't be independently verified. Today, Iraqi special forces also moved 1,000 people out from villages near the front lines, while at the same time ahead of them, ISIS are said to have grown increasingly brutal in the city as it seeks to eliminate potential threats from among the local population. And today we spent some time in the recently liberated town of Bartella. We saw some of the devastated churches there, but also some of their abandoned command centers. This is the oldest church in Iraq, and it was under ISIS control for over two years. You can see, just by looking around, the deliberate desecration of holy sites here. The altar has been burned, the crosses have been ripped off the walls, but this church is still standing. Many others have been razed to the ground. Nearby, in another church, we found an ISIS command center. It was rigged with IEDs, and in one room, we found suicide belts and sniper rounds. On the wall here, you have a crudely drawn ISIS flag. This room was used for their meetings. Over here, you can see the roster, where snipers had to go in the village and at what time. But most chillingly, if you look down here, you see a list of where those snipers should be aiming, the most vulnerable spots on the body. And the top three are eyes, nose, and ears. You know, fascinating to see how they organize themselves, but also very chilling to see the destruction they leave behind them. And of course, that makes you think what's going to happen ahead in the battle for Mosul itself. Jenna? Benjamin, thank you. All right, so that was courtesy of Fox News. Now, the reason I pulled that up was that Americans don't trust Iran, Iran doesn't trust Iraq, Iran's covered Iraq, Sunnis and Shias have been each other its throats for a thousand years, and the Kurds want to be left alone. That is one of the best summaries I have tripped over. As coalitions go, the one piece together to dislodge ISIS from its Iraqi stronghold Mosul is an odd one. But right now, everybody's kind of playing nice and working together. But things could be tested as fighting increases. This strange offensive has put the U.S. on the same side as Iran. How often do you hear me say Iran is on the same side of anything as the U.S.? This is all while Iran is taking more U.S. citizens captive and demanding ransoms, thank you Obama for paying the first time, to free them. Now Iran has never hid its desire to exert influence over its neighbor, even back to the 1980s when we had the Iran-Iraq war. I 
I mean, no one knows how strong the Iranian influence is, but no American forces will ever be commanded by Iran, and that is according to Lieutenant Steve Townsend. And, uh, I'm looking at Galloway, Galloway, where's his title? I don't have it. I don't have a title for Galloway, but, you know, it, the militias do play a key role, particularly in clearing areas around Mosul, because there's an estimated 6,000 mostly Sunni ISIS fighters hold up inside the Sunni, a traditionally Sunni city. That means they don't want the Shia militias, and Baghdad has rightfully barred them from entering the city out of concern that they would commit further atrocities. I mean, Iraq is Shia dominated, so naturally Iran is going to have a lot of influence. Iran's not afraid to, afraid to play here. And uh, this, according to Shawan Mohammed Tihi, a former Iraqi parliament member, and head of Security and Defense Committee in Baghdad from 2010 to 2014, he said the bipolar American policy and military presence has emboldened Iran. In other words, on one hand, we're feeding Iran cash and making, making deals with them. On the other hand, we're saying no, no, no. I mean, really? The Shia militias, known as popular mobilization forces, are seen as an Iranian proxy. And they don't want to work with U.S. troops and insisted that U.S. troops had fired on them. It's not just U.S. forces who have reason to distrust the Shias. And that's according to a Kurdish Peshmerga lieutenant general stationed near the Syrian border. And according to him... They didn't give a name for him. There's no difference between Shia militias and ISIS. All right. I have one last story, and then I got to get, get a move on, because I got to prep for another show. Yes, I've got to fill in for Rick tonight on the Jen and Rick show, which will be starting around the top of the hour. Can't guarantee we won't be, but just a few minutes late. All right, I got a U.S. Army story. Yes, a good, fun story. U.S. Army. Trading places. Transition from athlete to soldier. Fairly simple for Olympian. With the vibrant atmosphere of last summer's Olympiad in Rio de Janeiro, now a distant memory, Sam Kendricks, the bronze medal winning athlete, can now settle into the role of Sam Kendricks, Army Second Lieutenant. Mississippi born and bred soldier traded his athletic workwear for the camouflage duty uniform October 3rd when he began the 16 week transportation basic officer leading course at the Army Logistics University. The reservist said the transition from the athletic endeavor to military training environment has been minimal because the levels, levels of focus needed to be successful are similar. Wherever I go around the world, I'm always wearing the uniform, under the skin, and having to represent, because you never stop being a professional athlete, as you would never stop being an officer. It really allowed me to step back into a role I was rather familiar with. Kendrick, aside from placing third in pole vault, earned even greater acclaim when true to wearing the uniform under the skin, he halted his sprint during qualifications to stand at the position of attention while the U.S. National Anthem was played for another athlete. His act of honor was featured on media outlets around the world and eventually got the attention of the commander-in-chief. Thank you, Sam, said the pres President Barack Obama, recalling him the moment at a White House event honoring U.S. Olympic and Paralympic teams on September 29th. The 24-year-old Kendrick's character and athletic excellence has its root in an Oxford, Mississippi family, headed by none other than a Marine veteran and high school track and field coach, Scott Kendricks. I tried to instill some discipline into him and his brother, 
said the elder Kendricks of Sam and his fraternal twin Tom. We used to get up together in the mornings and run. We did a lot of push-ups and sit-ups. The Ken environment in which the Kendrick children were reared demanded discipline. The family was raised horses and other animals that required constant attention. The work was also humbling. Sam and his brother had plenty of chances to exercise their olfactory system as well as working their biceps, scooping manure on a daily basis. We wanted them to have a work ethic. We wanted them grounded. Hendrick's way of child rearing would pay off for Sam, considered only a mediocre pole vaulter in the beginning. His father admits he was probably the worst pole vaulter prospect I ever coached. Sam surged ahead on his path toward improvement. Eventually, because of that worth ethic, he got better, and pretty soon he was the guy who was doing the winning. But he had to earn it. That's one reason he's so grounded and humble. The move paid dividends. During his sophomore year at Old Miss, Sam made his biggest leap in ability in, pole, in vaulting to more than 19 feet and three-quarter inches. That's huge. That's almost two stories, folks. It was a personal best by almost eight inches, Sam recalled, of the event at the 2013 Clyde Littlefield Texas Relays. He went on to win an NCAA national championship that year. The achievement underscored what could be accomplished by a once, a once subpar athlete and a volunteer co coach with no pole vaulting coaching experience whose pairing was subject to father's coaching son pitfalls. Sam later propelled himself into ath amateur athletic stratosphere, earning the 2013 and 2014 NCAA outdoor titles, among other ac accolades. Feeling the need for greater competition, Kendricks decided to leave the old, old Miss track and field pro program to turn pro in 2014. He did continue on as a ROTC student and engineering major graduate in 2015. I wanted to make a living in the sport, he said. That meant building notoriety. The Olympics would help. He finished first at the Olympic trials and aimed his pole towards Rio. His father and his girlfriend came along. It was surreal, said Sam, pointing out winning the me medal and standing atop the podium with millions watching was not the proverbial cherry on top moment for him. It was an internal victory and gratitude long before I stepped on the runway to compete. I wondered if I won a medal, what would I do? I decided I was going to feel that way now. I'm really going to internalize what it means to be a winner and a loser and understand that neither of those matter. It's my ability to compete that most important. I'm going to enjoy that. That time on the podium was for everyone else. Sam's ability to capture perspective might serve him well as a student. He's, his deep, he has given deep thought to what it means to be a leader and his stature as a championship athlete might influence others. I think I can help soldiers by helping to convey the short-term goals equate to long-term goals by emphasizing discipline and detail. My mission as an athlete is to jump high, Mike, but my goal is to compete well. To do both, I must do the small things. I must get a little faster, get a little stronger, and learn a little bit more. If I can do all those things every day, I can accomplish a mission. Kendricks is assigned to the 655th Transportation Company, 373rd and Quartermaster Battalion, 38th Regimental Support Group, based in Millington, Tennessee. He said the unit was more than supportive during his Olympic quest. Kendricks has set his sight on the 2017 World Championships in London. All right. On that note, folks. On that note. I'm out of here!